Hello, I'm Ari, uh, your host at Episteme Entrepreneur, the podcast dedicated to scientist entrepreneurs that will impact uh, our lives uh, with their amazing ventures. Today, as a co-host, uh, I have the support of my friend Cheyenne Machatian, CEO of Silverberry Group, um, a Silicon Valley-based startup studio. And we hope you will have fun to discovering this with us the story of a brilliant entrepreneur. It's a pleasure to welcome Dr. Morgan Parfit David, PhD in Behavioral uh, Sciences from the University of Quebec in Montreal and the University of Burgundy in France. Dr. Par Parfit David is a brilliant entrepreneur. He is the founder CEO of Analytica, a consulting company founded in 2015 that applies evidence-based psychological techniques to business strategy and performance. He is also uh, the founder CEO of Predicta Football, a company founded in 2019 with a remarkable claim the first science-based talent identification tool for predictive recruitment in football. And by football, I mean the real football, the soccer one, the one we play in Europe and Latin America. <laughs> nice to have you, Dr. Parfit David. How are you today? I'm, I'm, I'm fine, thank you. How are you, Ari? Fine, fine. Thank you very much. How are you, Cheyenne? Awesome. Thank you. Excited to be here. Great, great. Just uh, before we talk about your company and your amazing offers, uh, let's talk about a little bit about uh, the young Morgan who entered university uh, 17 years ago. Um, why did you choose to study behavioral sciences? Um, and also, could you explain us what is or are uh, this word science? Mm -hmm. Well, to make it very brief, uh, I, I was interested in, in the natural world uh, in general. And uh, in particular, uh, evolution, you know, evolutionary biology back then, and how, why we observe what we observe and why uh, animals behave the way they do. Uh, so that's the reason why I studied behavioral sciences related to evolutionary biology. Uh, I wanted to understand why a, animals make certain decisions and not others. And uh, it turns out that it has a lot to do with their uh, psychology, of course, and uh, the, what we call heuristics that they use, the way they treat information, the way they um, perceive information and how it affects their behavior. So this is why I got interested in behavioral sciences in the first place. So, well, behavioral sciences, that's quite a general term, you know, and uh, well, it's related to psychology, social psychology, cogniz cognition, and so on. So it's quite a general term. Um, but well, when you're a researcher, uh, you're uh, used to get information in uh, scientific in scientific literature, in scientific papers, and uh, that gives you the opportunity to reach a, a, a quite decent level of expertise in different fields. That's why I specialized in a well, animal and human behavior. Um, and uh, cognitive psychology, social psychology. So this is what I've been doing as a researcher. And, uh, and yeah. So at the very beginning, you had, uh, or you, you, you dreamed to become a, an academic scholar and performing research in a lab, or, or did you have already, you know, this, uh, the seed of becoming an entrepreneur? Well, that was my initial plan, actually, to be a researcher. Mm -hmm. I uh, studied in France. Uh, my home country, and uh, the well, you, you you should know the situation in France too. Uh, when when people do uh, a PhD in France, they're PhD candidates, and the idea is to become a researcher. There's there's no uh, uh, straightforward path between uh, academia and, and and the industry in France. So this is why when you start PhD, your goal is to become a researcher eventually, and this is what this was my goal. And uh, it turns out that uh, life's hard and uh, it's quite uh, difficult to get a position in academia in France, especially when you've left France for a while. And, and I did, because I only did half my PhD in France and the rest of my academic career abroad uh, in, uh, in Canada, in, in the UK, in Belgium. And when you come back in France, nobody knows you. Mm. And uh, it, it's, uh, it doesn't make things easy to find a position. And this is why I, uh, I left academia eventually. And, um, and I thought about all the expertise and all the experience that I gained over these years. And I thought uh, I wouldn't like to lose all that. And I, I believe 
I could find a way to transfer that, that expertise and, and all, all that knowledge and experience for a company to take advantage of it. And this is why I thought, well, let's do some consultancy then. And this is why I funded Analytica in the first place. So uh, it was not, uh, I mean, um, a discovery or uh, uh, an Eureka moment during your PhD or postdoctoral, postdoctoral study. It was the, 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 the how can I say, the, the amount of your expertise, you say, you, you watch your expertise and you see, you, I can do something with that. Yes, exactly. Um, I, I was doing very theoretical research when I was a researcher. Uh, it couldn't be easily applied to the real world, actually. So it, it took it took some time and and uh, and and work and thoughts to uh, imagine imagine how I could transfer all that knowledge and expertise into something concrete that uh, businesses and companies could use eventually. So this is why it wasn't that straightforward uh, at the start. And. Uh, uh, how, what was uh, how was the reaction of the academic uh, of the academics uh, you worked with a PhD supervisor or or even later in the in the postdoc study when you quit the academic path to become a, uh, an entrepreneur did, did they do you do, do you did you did you have uh, the support of the university or the academics around you or well the, the support I wouldn't say that um, I would say that. People were quite shocked, not in a negative way, uh, but they were shocked because, as I told you, they, they, there isn't a strong path between academia and, in, and the industry. Uh, it's uh, even even more true in behavioral sciences, where people do something very theoretical, uh, at least in my field, you know, in, in behavioral uh, animal behavior, human behavior. Um, so, well, a, I think you got to be practical. Uh, and and my PhD supervisor back then told me, well, if that's your choice, I, I think I think you could be a good researcher. I would like you to be a researcher. I would I would be proud of it. But at the same time, you gotta you gotta think about your career. And if you think that you gotta uh, you wanna you wanna leave academia now and, and start your own business, then that that's good. That, that'd be a good achievement too. So I got some encouragement from him. Yeah, definitely. But that's really unusual. Before we talk about uh, Analytica, um, uh, have you still connection with the academic world, or do you still uh, because you, you need because as you are consulting a company, you need to to keep your expertise at its top at its top level, right? So, uh, do you have uh, still a connection with the academic world, or how do you nurture your your um, your expertise? Well, I don't have strong connection uh, with the academic world anymore. Um, and I think the reason for that is that I've got a good internet connection and access to uh, scientific <laughs> journals, and that is the most important, I guess. Uh, so I uh, I uh, try hard. Uh, um, uh, I, uh, I, st I still screen the uh, you know the table of contents of many different scientific journals every month. So this is how I keep track of what's new in the field, and, and, and what's trendy, what people are doing, what tools are using. So uh, yeah, I try to keep my uh, knowledge level at, at a certain uh, uh, well level, you know, uh, keep track of what's going on in the scientific world, definitely. <laughs> uh, as you know, this podcast is mainly dedicated to PhD and postdoc who, who would like to, to quit their academic career and to, to become an entrepreneur. So at this moment, you quit the, the academic uh, career. Can you just uh, tell us the story uh, day by day, even month and month? How 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 was it uh, for you? Well, that was a lot of excitement uh, to start with, because uh, when you're a researcher and you find your own company, you don't you don't realize how hard it could be. Not saying that's always hard. I don't want to discourage people listening to that podcast, but um, uh, you're quite naive, you know, when, when you come out of academia. So, well, I would say that I had things in mind. I knew I could do a lot. I could bring a lot of knowledge and expertise to businesses. So I thought, well, uh, I'm going to wait for businesses to come and ask me what they want me to do for them. And that wasn't the right stance to, to adopt, actually. Um, I think you got to be proactive if you want to launch, you want to launch your company and, and have clients and be useful for businesses. So by by this, I mean that you need to build offers, you need to build services. You can't just say, 
Hey, hello, I'm Morgan Parfit David. I have a PhD in behavioral sciences. What would you like me to do for you? You can't really do that. You really have to tell people what you can do for them and not just who you are and what you've done in the past. So you've got to build your own offers, your own services. And this is what I've done. I, it, it took me a couple of years to understand that. Mm. Uh, uh, but I, yeah, yeah, I, I think that that's very important. There are many things that are important when you build your own, you uh, launch your, your business. But uh, thinking about uh, creating carefully designed services and offers it is is the first crucial step towards becoming a successful entrepreneur definitely uh, it's exactly the same thing for uh, scientists and engineers who who are very techy you know who who have a new technology and they think that the technology by itself will will be will be will be will be sold but in fact they don't understand that they have to change this the technology into a product into a service or an offer you mm -hmm. know and uh, it's, it's exactly what you have done with your expertise, and it's very interesting. And we will um, and we will talk about it uh, right now because uh, it's it's a uh, it's a very fascinating uh, what you have done with uh, with Analytica and then with Predicta Football. Cheyenne, if you have any question, do not hesitate to answer because you know I, I I'm a very I'm very wordy, so do, do not hesitate to call me if you have any questions. No, no, sure. No, this is uh, fascinating. Actually, yeah, I'm just uh, taking notes uh, when we get, especially on, uh, you know, the product side, I would say. But uh, I have one question, uh, basically, when it comes to scientific companies, like uh, what you have done, or as we call it, a scientific mind, uh, you know, making a shift coming to create services. And so, you know, there are, um, if we consider in a spectrum, we have a basic science research that universities do. On the other side of the spectrum, we have uh, companies that take the established science and rapid technology to create a service. And then I would say we have in between some, uh, you know, companies that they uh, take the existing science as they add something to it. Then, uh, you know, it's not only wrapping established science and technology, they also create some value in between in scientific wise. That, might worse to create some report and uh, you know feedback loop for contribution to science. So I wanted to know, as you are uh, doing uh, this work, how how do you decide if you are uh, adding to science, you are taking the existing science and create a service out of it? What is your methodology? What are your thinking around it? Before getting into details, I wanted to understand mm -hmm. your methodology about you know. Yeah, definitely. Well, I think my first ob observation back then was. There's a lot of knowledge out there in academia that's locked behind, uh, uh, yeah, behind uh, the laboratory's door, and, and and it doesn't come out of academia. So that was my first observation. I thought that a lot of knowledge was missed by the industry and businesses, and this is why I thought, well, there's there's a lot I can use. So I I was taking the knowledge and the techniques that have been created by social psychologists. And my plan was to use them in the real world. All right. So you you, you know about, for, for instance, you know um, what features of the packaging uh, are important to uh, 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 customers, and how different features can affect their perception of a product, uh, their judgment of a product, and their their intention to purchase, and things things like that. So I thought, well, this is something that uh, academics know, but something that the industry doesn't know. Obviously, when you look at advertising, you know the advertisements, packaging, branding, and so on. You can you can clearly tell that people in the industry don't know all this knowledge about uh, um, consumer psychology. And and I, I think that answer your that answers your question, Cheyenne. I, I I take knowledge and techniques from the academic world, and I transfer it to businesses. Um, I wouldn't say I create anything that'd be meaningful for academics right now. <laughs> no, it's a big task. I just wanted to know, you know, how you think about this methodologically. That's great. Yeah, absolutely. I, I love what you said, knowledge being locked, right? Uh, so unlocking the, you know, existing knowledge and put it in the hands of people that they can use it. Uh, that's like a great gap. We always need to catch up with it. 
so uh, perfect transition. Uh, in 2015, you founded Analytica, a consulting company specialized in behavioral and, behavioral and psychological engineering. So please, uh, Morgan, could you could you uh, present us uh, Analytica to our audience and your offers? Who are your clients and what are the typical needs and demand of your clients when they hire your service? Mm -hmm. Well, that's a wide question. Um, <laughs> um, well, what I do with Analytica is that I I uh, use evidence-based techniques in social psychology and behavioral sciences as a well. whole. So that's mostly neuromarketing, customer psychology, uh, social psychology, uh, behavioral economics. So any uh, technique taken from social psychology that can be used in, in, in real world business processes and so on. Um, so, well, to make it very clear and, and, uh, and understandable, there's a service that I've created that's called Cogni Packaging. This is why I, I talked about Cogni Packaging about packaging a couple of minutes ago. Uh, Cogni Packaging, what I do with Cogni Packaging is that I, I uh, advise uh, brands about how to design their packaging so that they have the, uh, uh, the, the, the best impact on customers. So the idea is to uh, design packaging in terms of you know, colors, uh, shape, uh, claims, and, and, and things like that. Mm. in a way that's going to affect customers' perception, customers' judgment and intention, you know, into something more positive. So the idea is to make packaging that's perceived as, well, have, has the brands that want their packaging to be seen, all right? So you, um, can, you can advise, uh, for example, a designer in a company to uh, drive his design into a particular way so you can you can uh, drive you know uh, the perception of the client in a part in a specific way. Did, did I uh, did I exactly, understand well? That's exactly it. Uh, to give you a concrete example, I worked for a brand, a pasta brand in France, big pasta brand in France uh, uh, last year, and uh, they, they wanted to advertise more clearly and in a more obvious way that their pasta uh, were made in France. All right, mm. and it isn't as easy as it's. Uh, in, in in first place is you, you got to make it clear uh, and, and and usually they use a very tiny uh, um, I don't know, don't know how to say that you know they, they that French flag a little mm. French flag somewhere on the packaging very small not very obvious and uh, what I do be, beyond advising brands is that I also do consumer studies so I do carefully design consumer studies based on you know, neurosciences and social psychology to um, uh, understand people's per people's perceptions and judgments about the brand, about the packaging, about the claims. And it turns out that this new packaging, the new packaging that the brand had designed, actually, it actually didn't uh, increase people's perception of the French uh, origins, you know, of the, the pasta, French origin of the pasta. So it didn't seem that the pasta were made in France more than with the original packaging. So I, I would say that's a big fail by the uh, design team. Um, so that's the kind of thing that I, I can advise brands on. And I also do the consumer studies that go with it. Uh, so as to uh, well, confirm that what I have advised uh, is functional, works or, or not, uh, in which case we, we uh, work again on packaging. And if it works, so um, you know the big problem currently is that brands are using marketing agencies, adver advertising agencies, and these people are just biased, just like any customers uh, answering uh, questionnaires about brands and, and uh, the perception about brands and packaging. They're, they're just biased. They answer in a very subjective way, and uh, fortunately, that doesn't bring any insights for uh, brands to build their commercial and uh, marketing strategy. So that, that's the big problem that I can help with uh, regarding company packaging. The packaging, uh, the packaging is a very great challenge for any company who's, who, who sell uh, pro goods uh, because we know uh, since Apple with its with its fancy uh, packaging that the packaging is by itself is a product. You know, you, you, you we see all these video on YouTube of people who who you know who unbox you know their 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 product and they are very happy to receive the box etc. And the box by itself is uh, is very the box the box and the packaging are by, by themselves very important for the perception of the value mm -hmm. uh, of the product. You have also a very interesting uh, offer. Uh, uh, branded as Cogni menu, could you 
could you talk about us uh, this service and how did you do you have the idea to serve the restaurant owner mm -hmm. because this is this is something very interesting also to, mm -hmm. to share with the audience yeah sure so company menu is a menu engineering service um that's the idea of Cogni Menu, but the idea behind Cogni Menu is that people's decisions and behavior is predictable to a certain extent. All right. So that means that if you know what conditions trigger a particular decision in customers, then you can recreate that decision environment to uh, increase the likelihood that customers are going to take, are going to make a, a particular decision. All right. Uh, so it is quite easy to uh, influence uh, people this way, all right? So recreating an environment that triggers a, a certain decision. And the, the, the idea behind Cogni Menu is that, you know, a restaurant menu is something uh, uh, that's limited and restricted in time and space. That means menu are usually an A4 sheet or something very small. So the decision environment is very small. And at the same time, people make their decisions in, in a minute or a couple of minutes. OK, so I thought the restaurant menu is a is a is an ideal candidate to use influence strategies and, and, and psychological uh, tricks to improve uh, uh, all orders on, on, on particular meals. All right. Mm -hmm. uh, so the idea is to encourage selection of meals that have the highest margins, for example, for example, OK, so if if you reorganize the menu, you optimize the presentation, the labeling, the pricing in a way that makes some meals more appealing than others, then customers are going to choose uh, some uh, meals in a higher proportion than with the original menu. And if these meals have a highest margin, have a higher margin than others, then this is going to uh, increase the uh, restaurant benefits, the restaurant owner's benefits. And that's all I to be behind uh, uh, Cogni Menu. And that's called menu engineering. So you can you can uh, orientate you can orientate uh, the choice of uh, the customer in a particular way that, of course, is uh, good for the restaurant owner. I read somewhere uh, as an example that uh, I don't know if it was maybe in a behavior science book uh, that in a, in a steakhouse they drive they they, um, they drove an experiment uh, and you know uh, they the in the menu it was written uh, chief steak and when you write chief steak it's mainly the the men who choose uh, the the this item and when you say the when you write um, a steak cut by the chef it's the lady who, who who took the steak you know because the perception is different you know cut means you know very delicate and something like that and it can com completely orient you know the choice of the the, the client mm -hmm. into into an item or, or, or another um yeah, you, yeah that's, that's very interesting um well it turns out that people people's decisions are both uh, irrational but predictable uh, mm. to paraphrase a, a, a book by uh, this behavioral economist forgot the name of uh, dan dan Ariely. Mm -hmm. So decisions are both irrational and predictable. So if you understand in what environment decisions are made, then you can recreate that environment, trigger the decision, generate those decisions. And it, it, it's quite well known in cognitive psychology, actually, that if you leave uh, uh, customers with a choice between three or four options, A, B, C, D, this is uh, actually quite easy to influence people towards a given choice, a given option. Yeah. As as uh, surprising as it may seem, so uh, you can you can re increase uh, the bill at the end uh, of the meal. Uh, you can also orientate the different kind of items. So if, if for example a restaurant wants to sell more of kind of food or, or dish, uh, you can also orient it like that. Uh, what 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 other uh, outcomes you can we can get with the Cogni menu, and Cogni sale in general? Uh huh. Well, that's also. Um, improving the sales of uh, meals with higher margins and this is how it's beneficial for uh, owners and, and customers too. The idea is not to rip people off and make people spend more that they would like to. Uh, this is also encouraging the sales of um, uh, higher margins meals and in, in this case the, the, uh, the, event, the, the final bill doesn't change but actually the profits made by the owner uh, are increased. So this, this is the beauty of it, I'd say. <laughs> but otherwise, this is something you can do in, in shops too. Uh, reorganize the shop, 
uh, reorganize the, the, the pricing, work on pricing of different items and products in the shop uh, so as to uh, uh, well, increase spending or increase the, the uh, selection of higher uh, margins products. So that's something that can be easily done in, in shops too. Um, yeah. Uh, the COVID crisis, as you know, has uh, massively impacted the hospitality uh, industry. Uh, did you have the, the opportunity uh, to offer your service to help the restaurant owners to, to move from the take-in model to the take-away or, or delivery model uh, to help them with their website or, mm -hmm. or, or something like that? Did you have mm -hmm. this opportunity? Yes, exactly. Uh, something I've, uh, I've been doing recently with a, a restaurant in Toulouse in southern France. Um, a, a young entrepreneur at launching his own restaurant. Unfortunately, the COVID crisis happened in the meantime and uh, it, it made it very hard for him. I, I, honestly, I, I'd like to uh, give a shout out to restaurant owners at the moment. That's very hard for them. And then launching your own restaurant, restaurant in that period is very uh, courageous. So uh, that, I'm, I'm, I'm very impressed by these people. Um, and uh, so, yeah, so this person came and he said, well, I've done the, the website myself. Uh, I, I'm a, the only person working in my restaurant. I'm doing the food. I'm doing the selling. I'm uh, taking reservations and all that. Uh, and he clearly needed some help. Uh, so I worked on his website to uh, uh, increase a you know customer experience, improve the customer experience to make me as, uh, you know more appealing and make the uh, selling a process uh, easier uh, online uh, and uh, help him sell his meals you know, better, I would say. Um, so, so yeah, this is something I've done recently. And unfortunately, I've done that right before the big restrictions in that so-called sanitary pass uh, in, in France. And he's lost something like 80% of his income in, in a week or two. So that's very hard for them. So, so I guess that making customer experience straightforward, as straightforward as you can on your website, it, it is crucial. I mean, you can't you you can't skip that. That's an option. That's a path that has to be taken by by, by restaurants at the very moment because of the COVID crisis. Great. Um... Cheyenne, do, do not hesitate and to cut me now because I'm wordy, so I will talk, 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 talk. So do not hesitate to cut me. Sure, sure. Please continue. I'm taking notes and uh, <laughs> I I mean. So uh, concerning um, uh, how uh, at the, how when you started and even now, you know, because uh, I think uh, the problem is, is still there, how uh, you make known your company and your offers to uh, your client uh, uh, because behavior sciences are not very well known by most people and even by professionals and you know it's uh, mm. it's something because first of all it's a pluridisciplinary pluridisciplinary uh, era of study so what is it is it psychology social is it sociology is it the neuroscience and when you say neuroscience nobody knows exactly what it is you know uh -huh. I, I'm, a, I'm a neuroscientist by training but nobody understands what is this neuroscience so so um, how do you make known your your company your offers uh, uh, did uh, uh, did you uh, need to evangelize uh, your, mm -hmm. your your target, or did they mm -hmm. already knew they already or they already knew what was uh, your offers and they were waiting for you? Yeah, well, I've got a mixed answer here. Um, <laughs> it turns out that, as you said, people don't know a lot about neurosciences and behavioral sciences in general, especially in the industry. So it takes a lot of a uh, what we call dissemination, you know, explaining people what behavioral applied behavioral sciences are. So this is why I created a blog to start with and I, I was publishing uh, articles quite regularly about uh, latest scientific findings and how we can apply these findings to real world. Uh, so this is what I've been doing in the first place and well contacting people to you know decision makers uh, of course it's pretty straightforward uh, but yeah yeah it takes a lot of uh, effort and investment into disseminating knowledge and telling people what you do, what you can do. Um, so, yeah, yeah. Uh, I think where you are, where you have uh, some uh, strength is that you can you can promise some some strong um, outcomes, you know, uh, because um, this this is the strength of your consulting, I think, because because, for example, when we see uh, when we see uh, when we watch when we visit the, the site of Predictica, you know, when you can say we can predict by 
uh, 2.7 uh, that uh, a young athlete will be uh, mm. uh, will be a challenge uh, fighter of, uh, you know you, you have this you, you can you can you can promise a strong claims uh, mm -hmm. to your clients so this is I think a strength no I think it is indeed uh, but w we say that because we're both scientists and mm. to us figures and numbers are very important and it makes sense to us but it doesn't make sense to everyone um, you know, I, I've talked, when I started my company in France, I talked to a, a, a very big company, the CEO of a very big advertising company. And when I told him what I could do, uh, about what I could do and the, uh, the uh, increase in, in uh, uh, performance that I could bring to advertising and things like that, he wasn't that impressed actually. Uh, because for him, uh, his old job consists in selling adverts, you know, well, selling mm. adverts and, and create adverts. And he says, well, I just need adverts. I don't need them to be efficient. OK, <laughs> so as far as far as you deal with that, that type of person, then uh, bringing science on the table doesn't help that much. Uh, but I would say that this is a strength anyway, um, because what I do, I can measure, you know, I've worked for a restaurant two years ago and I, I said, you know, what we're going to do is uh, I'm going to work and optimize your menu. And what you're going to do in following six weeks, you're going to propose to your customers my optimized menu one week and the following week your original menu. And we've done that for um, six weeks in a row. And I said, well, in the end, we're going to do the stats. We're going to uh, plot the numbers and, and see if, it's, if it has worked or not. Mm. If, I, uh, if I've increased the sales and margins and so on, and it turns out that I've increased uh, I've increased profits by 5% and um, I, I, I've increased with that menu, we managed to increase sales of the uh, um, higher margins meals by 5 to 20%. So it, it had been very efficient with only minor modifications to the original menu. You know? uh, so we didn't change the whole menu, uh, just a little bit of pricing, a little bit of how we describe meals, how we, we name them how we organize the, the menu, and here we are. It was earning uh, a, an additional thousand uh, uh, euros every every week. So it, it, that makes quite a, a change. It's quite an improvement, yeah. So, so it was uh, the proof of the, the concept for, you know, for the professionals, you know, so you, you bring a new mm -hmm. service and you prove it that it works. Definitely, exactly, yeah. So, um, now I will ask you a question about you know more uh, about what is uh, interesting for us as Shai mm -hmm. for Cheyenne and uh, uh, me is about the startup scene, the tech startups. Uh, what about applying behavior science to help tech startup uh, and founders to succeed and diffuse their innovation? You know uh, uh, the I, I don't know if you know uh, the diffusion uh, curve um, graph of the, of innovation. Uh, you, first of all, when you bring something new, a technology or a product, you have always a community of early adopters, of innovators who are very mm -hmm. uh, hungry of, of novelty and et cetera. But then most of startups die because they can't diffuse to to, to, to bigger market. Mm -hmm. So do you think that behavior sales could be um, uh, could help startups and, and founders, you know, to 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 build this bridge between mm -hmm. the early adopters and to the mass market? Well, I think it can indeed. Um, I wouldn't say that's the only solution because, as you may know, well, when you launch a startup, there's a lot of different factors that can impact uh, your success and that sure. helps you uh, in increase your strength and power and 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 uh, and size. But uh, but well, so far so good. I think with behavioral sciences can help. Uh, I can give you a concrete example. So I've worked with a, a young company recently, and they sell um, uh, something that's quite innovative. Uh, it's a mix of tradition and innovation, but they sell a, a, um, um, how do you call that? A, a book, book, a book note, mm -hmm. uh, which uh, with with pens, which um, ink is uh, uh, erasable, so that that can be uh, er erased, so that the book note can be kept for uh, forever, basically. Okay, so you you just have to uh, er erase what we've written. So uh, their challenge is to uh, sell that product to the mass market now because they, they sell it to customers. So they're working following a B2C uh, uh, plan and now they want to they wanna sell their products in big supermarkets and, and, and so on. And, uh, and they, they come to see me because they wanted to know how to convince 
uh, supermarket directors to buy their products and sell them to their own customers. And uh, so what, what we've done is that we've done some uh, marketing studies uh, that focused on uh, understanding the psychology and profiling customers based on their, uh, well, behavior and, and profile. So the idea was to uh, understand what claim was important and what claim was more convincing for a given type of customer, okay? Uh, so they had different claims, but the fact that the product was made in France, uh, that it was environmentally friendly, that it was uh, uh, it could be customized and things like that. And the all customer study has consisted in understanding what was important for whom and uh, what was important for which type of psychological profile. And it turns out that there are differences between uh, women and men and, 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 and people who are older or younger, you know, young people, old people and people who have different uh, mindsets in terms of ecology and, and, and uh, uh, preserving the environment and so on. So it helps us to design a marketing and communication strategy that's more tailored you know, and personalized to a given type of customer. And this is really impactful and very convincing then to sell your, uh, your uh, product on the mass market. It's highly tailored, really. So you helped the, the startup to, to pivot. Sorry, Sharon, um, I just wanted to, to, to recap what uh, Morgan said. But you could follow, uh, follow on, please, please. Sure. Please, please Sharon. No, no, go ahead, please, please. <laughs> no, uh, uh, one thing I wanted to understand whether, uh, so uh, the goal of these uh, psychological analysis is it uh, to lead behavior change? Uh, because I also, you know, uh, was reading about, you know, uh, football analytical, about talent identification. Uh, basically, I wanted to know what kind of problem we are solving here. Can, is it possible that I say I want to be an athlete and you come and tell me, you know what, I did, uh, you know, some uh, analytic and you don't have the psychology to do it? or you help me to get better. So I'm not still clear about uh, w uh, what is the intervention, what is the result of mm -hmm. going through your service? If you can elaborate on that, it would be great. Uh -huh, uh -huh. Yeah, sure. Well, it, it turns out that uh, advertising efforts and marketing efforts are uh, made in the given direction. So basically it, the, the industry and, and brands can, uh, think and, and, and they, uh, they create their, uh, their, their marketing and, and advert in a way that's, um, I would say, uh, the same for every customer, okay? So that is efficient to a certain extent, but my claim is that if you adopt a different marketing strategy, a different advertising strategy as function of your, a, a different type of customer, psychologically, uh, psychologically speaking, okay, then you're going to be more effective I can give you an example. There's a study that's been published in uh, PNAS, one of the leading scientific journals uh, in the world in science. Uh, so a study has been published in 2017 showing that when you uh, adjust your marketing message to the personality of your target, then you, you can increase the sales of uh, mobile ads, mobile uh, applications, sorry, by up to 73%. So when you know how to communicate to a given psychological profile, uh, custom psychological profile, then you're going to be more efficient, more convincing, more persuasive, uh, persuasive, and, uh, and, and and yeah, increase sales eventually. So this is what I'm doing actually, refining marketing, marketing and advertising strategies. This this is what we're doing, and this goes through understanding people psychology, how they perceive information, uh, have it. They, they, they treat information and uh, how they adjust their behavior accordingly. Is, is that clear, Cheyenne? Uh, yes, so you are kind of predicting who will respond to what kind of campaign, basically. You are not trying to change behavior, you just give some prediction, is that right? He, well, in this particular example, yes, uh, in terms of changing behavior, that's something we could do too. Uh, that's I, I am being asked to do in, in other contexts, like, uh, I don't know, in contexts like just recycling behavior, making people more likely to uh, uh, take the bus instead of taking their car, or we're talking more about more uh, we're not citizen behaviors, virtuous behaviors, you see what I mean? So mm -hmm. it's, it's not that much related to marketing or sales, sales, 
it's more related to uh, public innovation and, and things like that. Uh, you know, we are in a pandemic and we know uh, almost everywhere in the world uh, there are some resistance to vaccination and uh, numbers are going up again and, uh, uh, you know, uh, the conversation, at least in the health context that we are involved in, it's not just about education, right? People know and, you know, the fact and uh, numbers, you cannot argue with them, right? For instance, in US, you can see uh, the, there is a obvious correlation between rate of vaccination and uh, those uh, that have lower vaccination, you see absolutely bigger number of, uh, you know, numbers and hospitalization and ICU, all those things, right? But it's still that, uh, you know, uh, adoption doesn't uh, happen. And uh, it all goes back to uh, why people, as you mentioned at the beginning, why people do what they do, right? How, why we behave as we behave. And so uh, it, my mind just uh, keeps spinning that how we can use this science in order to, you know, make that kind of positive mm -hmm. change. If it, if it can happen in large scale or it is really, very, you know, still science is limited to very specific groups for a specific context. Mm -hmm. So how applicable is this science to solve those kind of, you know, mm -hmm. uh, problem as a, at the population level? Mm -hmm. Well, it, it is definitely, it can be applicable to that kind of challenge. Because um, the, 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 the main, uh, um, the main uh, argument behind that is that information isn't that useful. But can be, but not to everyone. Some people base their decisions and their behavior on information, objective facts, and, and some aren't. Uh, and, and most of them uh, aren't actually. We're, we're, we're influenced by, by a lot of different factors. Uh, you know, they, they, I thought about a study earlier that showed that when you asked people their opinion about climate change, you know, like, do you think that it's getting warmer? Uh, it's been warmer the last 10 years. Uh, they're affected by uh, subtle uh, uh, um, details like plants. You know, if you ask them that question in a room where there's a, a bouquet of flowers, uh, of uh, a, a alive flowers, you know, blooming, then they're going to they're gonna say, no, there's no, no climate change, that's not such a thing. And if you ask them the same question with a pot of flowers and they're all, they're, they've all died recently, they're, they're, they're going to say that they believe more in climate change. You see what I mean? So people, people's knowledge, uh, psychology and behavior are so much affected by subtle details, you know, subtle environmental cues that information usually isn't enough. So there's definitely a all, um, a all range of techniques, uh, you know, something that we call nudges, something that's is quite well known these days, you know, uh, nudges, so using uh, little little cues to influence people in a given way. Uh, and um, and yeah, and this isn't based on information and knowledge. This is based on cognitive biases and how people uh, uh, understand the information and how biased they are when they understand something and when they make a decision, when they adopt a, a given behavior. Uh, so definitely there are, there are so many techniques that we can use depending on the challenge. If you want to influence a lot of people at the same time, you can use nudges. If you want to uh, make kids at school more likely to uh, pick uh, beans and, and carrots at lunch instead of burger, then uh, you can do a small intervention in, in, in a small group and it's going to be very efficient too. Um, so yeah, we've got many techniques designed and, and tailored to different situations and challenges. Uh, I will uh, just add a, a point uh, on this uh, um, a nudge um, elaborated and driven by a government, I think will work if there is a trust. I think in France, I don't know elsewhere in the world, the anti-vax movement is mainly due because people have lost the trust to the government because of the lie of the lie. They, they lied so many times in the front of people in the in the camera. So now they, they, they are not against vaccine. They are against the government and they and, and you know the and they use that as, as reaction, you know, just to say uh yeah. I think it's it's my yeah. uh, it's not a scientific mm -hmm. proof, but it's uh Oh, well, that's backed up by science, actually, Ari, because that's what we call psychological reactants in, mm -hmm. in psychology. Absolutely. So that's, that's, that's the fact that people are just going to say no, or go in the opposite direction, because 
because something's been said by a figure of authority that they don't respect anymore. Exactly. And, and I think this is a big problem, this big mistrust in science at the moment. Uh, well, I'm not saying that the academic world is totally innocent there. Absolutely. Uh, because unfortunately, scientists don't communicate to people enough. They're too much, uh, they, they're too much focused on their, their research as a whole. They can't take a step back and look at big picture. So there's big, I think there's a scientific crisis moment in society and uh, we've got good examples every day, definitely, yeah. So uh, I would like to ask you a question before we start talking about predictive football, a question that is a transition. Uh, do you think that behavior science can help uh, investors, uh, angel investor or VC venture capitalists to select uh, founders uh, just like you do with Predicta, you know, to build a, a strong, resilient team uh, to increase the chance of success of the startup. I, I'm not talking about uh, predicting the success of the startup, you know, just like, uh, mm -hmm. uh, I don't know, uh, um, intelligence, art artificial intelligence can, could, could do, but just, you know, with psychology, you know, to select the good, a good uh, team members and to, to build it together and to, to make something that will be a very resilient and strong team for, for 10 years. Mm -hmm. Um, well, I'm not saying that's impossible. Um, I would rather say that we don't have the data yet. I'm not. I'm not sure we can uh, currently say that that kind of combination, from a psychological point of view, in, in in a team, is the right combination to launch a successful startup, to develop a successful startup. I'm I'm, I'm not sure about that. We've got some data in what we call organizational psychology that say that some combinations of psychological profiles are more efficient than others. But in the long term, in a, in a, in a startup context, I'm not sure. Uh, I, as I said, it's sh surely, surely there, there, there's something right here, something that can be done, but we, I, I don't think we've got the data yet. So mm -hmm. that, that would take some research and development. Mm -hmm. So it's worth to to put some money and to pay a, a couple of PhD students to 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 drive the studies. Probably, probably. <laughs> <laughs> so let's talk about Predicta Football right now. So you founded in 2019. It's uh, it's headquartered in um, Edinburgh, right? Yeah, we're in Scotland. Yes. Indeed. Yeah, great, great place. Uh, <laughs> so could you please present uh, Predicta Football, uh, your mm -hmm. offers, and who are your clients, and um, what is the story? What is the story behind Predicta Football? Uh, well, I'm not going to be very original here, but <laughs> the story behind Predicta Football is based on science and uh, scientific literature again. Um, so there, there's been a bunch of studies in the 2010s, year 2010s, that show that some uh, uh, psychological skills make soccer football players more likely to succeed in the future. Okay, and these studies, basically what they've done is that they've assessed uh, psychological skills in young people aged 12, 13, 14. Mm -hmm. And what they've done is that they came back to these the same players 10 years after and they've looked at how they were doing, all right? And, uh, and, and they've shown that some psychological skills could predict they're likely to succeed in the future, succeed in a professional club, be, being a successful athlete. Um, so th 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 there's been some studies like that published in, 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 20, in the tw year 2010. Um, so I knew that because I keep an eye on the scientific literature. So I, I, I knew that these studies existed and I thought there's something to be done here. Uh, why not gathering all the data that we know, uh, all the skills that we know predict uh, young players uh, likely to succeed in the future and gather them into a single tool. Uh, and this is what we've done. Uh, so basically what we do with predict football is that we can predict whether young players are likely to succeed in the future. And for that, we assess psychological skills like autonomy, uh, anxiety management, uh, competitiveness, uh, creativity. Mm -hmm. So that, that, that kind of psychological skills, cognitive skills. Uh, so we've gathered them, gathered them into a tool so players can go on our website and uh, get an assessment. Um, they answer to questionnaires, they do cognitive games uh, the like you can find in uh, mobile applications, for instance. And uh, then we analyze the data we uh, put them in a couple of algorithms we've created for that purpose. And in the end, we um, um, come with a, 
uh, a report that says, well, here are your raw results. So you're that competitive. Uh, you can uh, manage anxiety well. You're creative, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. And in the end, we get we, we give an estimate of their potential to succeed in the future. So we think that that kind of tool can be used by um, a football club uh, to uh, manage their investment into young players because uh, they they're costly, <laughs> they're expensive. You know, <laughs> young players are expensive in absolutely um, in uh, recruitment centres and. Uh, uh, in academies, uh, FIFA has estimated the cost of a player, uh, the yearly cost of a player in an academy to be something around ninety thousand uh, pounds a year. You know, every year a single player costs ninety thousand uh, pounds for for the club. So there's a lot of investments into these players, and if you can determine before recruiting player, if you can determine whether is more likely than another. A player to succeed in the future, then that can help you driving your investment and making wiser investments. Brilliant, brilliant. Uh, if um, because I see also on your side that individual uh, can also just uh, you know follow the assessment and the questionnaire and have their own uh, results. Uh, what about if I uh, I had the result that I am I I fell in every of your you know of your item. Uh, I'm not creative. I'm not. I'm not challenged. I'm not problem solver. I'm not everything. Uh, is it done for me, or, or do you think that the, with the you know the growth mindset uh, promoted by positive mm -hmm. psychology, we can we can help someone to to improve himself? Well, if you were 12 years old, I would say <laughs> nothing's lost for you. But unfortunately, I think your prospect of the future professional At footballer. At 44, I am done. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> well, I think so. You see, you don't need predictor for that. <laughs> but, sure. Um, well, uh, yeah. But, I mean, the, the mental side of things is just one aspect of future performance, all right? So to be a successful footballer, you need uh, to be good from a physical point of view, you need to be tall and strong enough, you need to have a, the, uh, a good physiological uh, um, features, uh, and, uh, and mental is just one aspect, it's mm -hmm. one parameter, okay? So that's important, but that doesn't determine 100% how how are you going to do in the future? Uh, so I would say that well, you got potential. You know, a lot of players have potential, but whether they're going to succeed in the future depends on their uh, mentality. Uh, it depends on their psychology and their cognition. All right. So I'm, I'm, what we do is we, we, we're just helping um, we're just helping clubs determine whether it's worth investing on some players, given that they have a lot of talented players in their clubs. There are lots of talented players out there. Okay. So I, and I would say that if one player takes the assessments and doesn't, uh, it, it doesn't show that he has good potential or uh, he's got low scores on some uh, on some uh, skills. Well, I would say I would say well, don't take it as granted. Uh, that doesn't mean you can't succeed in the future. You you should take this assessment as an opportunity to understand and figure out what your weaknesses and strengths are. And, and you got enough time to work on them, okay? Because a lot of players reveal themselves at 15, 16, 17 years old. So that doesn't mean if you get low scores at 12 or 13, that doesn't mean you can't succeed in the future, okay? So if a, if a club has the choice between two players and one has good uh, uh, got, got good scores on my predictor assessment, then that means they should pick a player. But if a player with low ratings come to me and 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 with his ratings and and, and uh, d doesn't know what to do with that. I'd say, well, don't, no despair. I mean, you mm -hmm. keep, keep working and, and now you know what to work on to improve your prospect. So, so nothing, nothing's carved in stone, I would say. That's psychology, you know, psychology can evolve. Um, so, yeah. So you, you accept uh, the, the incomes of um, uh, positive psychology, you know, it's a new trend in era in the scientific psychology. So you accept the fact that uh, with a growth mindset, we can we can we can fight our fate. To a certain extent, uh, to a certain I, I, extent. I'm, yeah, I'm I'm not, I'm not saying you, the the mental side of things is everything again. I mean, if if you're too short, if you can't if you can't shoot in the ball, then even if you have a right mentality, <laughs> sure. then you won't become the future uh, Ronaldo. So uh, no, I mean, 
it's multifactorial. You know, you got mm. you got lots of different influences. So it, it doesn't it doesn't take only the good psychology and the right psychological skills. Absolutely. Uh, so yeah, no, no psychology is an all definitely. And as you, in your assessment, when you when you evaluate the creativity, it's uh, it's very important because when when we witness on on the on the on the football uh, mm -hmm. ground the the how uh, virtuoso football player can do some amazing move, uh, you know, so creativity, yes, it's also physical creativity, and people doesn't get that. People think already always that creativity is something intellectual, you know, it's it's intellectual, even it's relay it's. Um, it's uh it's done by the body you know by of, of an athlete yeah. mm. it's related to perceptual motor skill motor skills definitely yeah 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 well it's been shown i mean the, the studies that i've used to, to create predictive football and the, the, these assessments uh they've been run on more than three thousand european players you know so that, that's quite solid we've got solid evidence that these skills predict uh future performance and 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 we're using psychometrics and uh you know psychological scales that have been developed by uh, psychologists and that are used by psychologists every day in academia so that's something solid yeah, yeah definitely mm. Mm. and uh, uh you have a league one uh, club as clients right now or do you work only with the with the training center or with amateur clubs uh well i, I i'm negotiating with league one clubs at the moment so, <laughs> so uh, I, I hope i hope i'm gonna yeah cross fingers i'm gonna work with some of them by the end of this year well we're, we're in like, pulling a, a good way so that should work but now i'm working with two uh premier league clubs in scotland at the moment um so st johnston in uh, the hearts so um yeah 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 but agents agents are interested in that tool too absolutely uh, it can help them uh finding uh, help them to find the, 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 their next big uh, big fish you know? <laughs> so. i see that in your team you have a a former uh, football agent uh this they are i think they are definitely the the right uh, target for you because you know mm -hmm. there are there are people who select the future talents yeah. <laughs> yes definitely and um, so agents Clubs, individual players, because as you may know, Cheyenne, I don't know, I don't know, I don't know if you know about soccer, but in, in North America, uh, the system is quite different from Europe. Uh, players are quite on their own, and they have to kind of work on their own to uh, be recruited and, and scouted and recruited by uh, professional academies and universities and so on. So this is why I think my tool could help them find the club and, and, and showcase their talent, if you want. Uh, if they got good uh, 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 predictor assessment, they can then go see a university or a, a, a club and say, well, look, this is how much I got. Uh, my potential has been estimated to uh, top 10% of my age category. So uh, this is a good argument to pick me in your team. See, uh, that's quite important in North America where, 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 where players are basically on their own. Do you think there is a tra transposition of your of your service in Predicta football to the to the American football, uh, you know, uh, uh, and other team sports? Because the NFL, you know, it's very very powerful and mm -hmm. successful uh, in the United States, and you know, you know, you have this transition between high school uh, in the United States for young athletes who dream to to become professional. You know, they mm -hmm. have to integrate first a uh, university or college uh, uh, team. Uh, mm -hmm. before becoming a professional in the NFL or other kind of sport, team sport. Mm -hmm. Do you think that uh, your tools uh, can be uh, transposable uh, to other sports? Mm -hmm. uh, well, definitely. But so far, predict football is very efficient to predict a future footballer's performance. All right, because we've used carefully designed studies uh, um, run on with footballers. OK, so I'm not saying that the same can't be done in other sports, but it needs to be done. It hasn't been done yet. All right. So that's why it's, it's also my goal to develop such a tool for other sports. Mm -hmm. And this is something we've started doing. Uh, but so far, such such a tool couldn't exist for any other um, sports. Uh, but I, 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 uh, I completely agree. I definitely agree. I concur that th th this tool should be developed for other sports, too. Yeah, there's so much investment, so much uh, money in the game that it's very important for clubs to know uh, how, how to make wise investments. So, 
being able to predict a player's future performance uh, in, in in five years, six year time is is quite powerful and, and relevant for clubs. Definitely, yeah, yeah. Absolutely, Jayan, you want to follow up with the uh, the question? Or... You are on mute. No, 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 no. Uh, all good. Uh, all good. So fascinating to hear about all these things. And congrats to signing up those teams, uh, you know, uh, to start using uh, your service. You know, we provide at our health uh, platform, we provide service to athletes. And it's about uh, how to use genetic assessment to better, you know, improve performance and, uh, you know, prevent uh, injury risk and all that. All that. So, uh, uh, working with talent is a huge, uh, you know, item and I guess more science is coming to the picture. Uh, on our side, we are very careful to say these are all and not to say, uh, you know, and if, if someone should join, you know, uh, a sport or not, everyone can join, everyone, you know, has the potential. Mm, the thing is, with this additional layer of information, how we can help to get results faster yeah. and, you know, concentrate the mm. effort. Like that. That's the same thing uh, also uh, with you. Also, another thing uh, I've, I've been thinking, we have a personality package. Uh, there are uh, huge, uh, large scale studies that uh, covers a personality trait based on genetic variations like leadership and mm. social ability and all those things. And uh, it would be very interesting to see how you know, those genetic variations can match with, you know, how we have been grown up, environment or lifestyle choices uh, and how we can combine uh, the two layers of information to maximize performance. That would be also very interesting. Uh, I don't know if anyone has done that because it's very complex, but that would be absolutely fascinating. Mm -hmm. to be I, I, I don't believe uh, there are many studies linking uh, well, genetics and personality and psychological skills in a sports context. There are mm -hmm. some, but not so many. So I'd, I'd be a good a good way to if you want to do something in the future. We've got a, it's all paved. We, we know what to do. <laughs> but uh, no, definitely. Uh, this is why I, I, you know this is also why I've been in touch with uh, recently with companies that uh, help young footballers showcase their talent by posting videos and and doing uh, workouts. You know, with with a camera, they got their mobile. And they films themselves doing a doing a, a particular workout, and there's artificial intelligence behind that, estimating uh, how good they are and measuring their, their performance from a physical point of view, and uh, and then their profile is linked to clubs and scouts uh, to help them find find a club. All right, and uh, so I, I'm in touch with that kind of company to add a layer to uh, their pro. The, players profile you know adding psychological scores and, and, and assessment of potential based on psychometrics so well in the end that'd be the perfect tool you know linking genetics morphology physiology mm -hmm. technique psychology that's the ultimate tool so yeah yeah sure should, <laughs> right on. should definitely have a conversation about that <laughs> sure <laughs> So it was a pleasure to meet you and learn about all the fascinating stuff you're doing <laughs> thank you Cheyenne <laughs> Morgan, uh, I'm a fan, you know, I follow you on Twitter and, uh, and I love your tweet, uh, you know, uh, particularly, you know, the, the, the quiz you, you offer to, to, the, to your audience. Uh, and, I, and I will, of course, share all the link uh, uh, of, your, of, your of your online presence. Um, we reach uh, the end of this interview. Uh, Morgan, do you have uh, any advice for a freshly graduate PhD or postdoc who would like to launch his or her own startup or business? A key advice? Yes, definitely. And I'm glad you asked the question because I, I've always thought, you know, I've been struggling. And if there, there are a couple of advice I can give to young entrepreneurs or even PhD becoming entrepreneurs, then this is what I'm going to say. And I think there are several criteria that are crucial to launching a successful business, especially when you're a, a, a former researcher. So you shouldn't neglect the importance of network. It's important to have a good network, a relevant network. And when you're a former academic, your network consists of people in academia. And this is not always useful to launch a successful business. So network is very important. And investment is very important too. I know it's, it isn't always possible uh, to make big investments. As far as I'm concerned, well, it wasn't my case. I, I didn't have money to make huge investments when I launched my company. 
but but that, that's useful too. So network, make investments, that's important. Otherwise, you can spend years trying to launch your business, just getting a couple of small contracts out there and not being able to really de develop your business. Mm. So yeah, network, very important. Uh, turn your service into something very applicable, understandable by companies and investing as, as soon as you can. I'm not talking about hundreds of thousands, but you know, investing into you know communication and get a tool refined and 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 well i i think these are good advice they're crucial advice and if you skip all steps you're unlikely to be successful not saying it's impossible but just think about it carefully perfect thank you morgan it was a real pleasure to have you today uh thank you shayan for for being with me today it was a real pleasure to have you both and um I will share everything on online uh, just after uh, the the interview. Thank you, Morgan. Thank you very much. Thank you for your invitation, Ari. Bye. Bye bye.